Good evening and welcome everyone to our seventh talk in this term's public seminar series um, here at the Refugee Study Center at um, the University of Oxford. Uh, my name is Dr. Hanno Brandkamp and I'm a department lecturer in forced migration here at the RSC in Oxford. Um, as many or most of you will be aware that the theme of this series is race, borders and global immobilities. And the aim is to better understand the violence that life seekers, refugees, migrants, asylum seekers and people on the move more broadly routinely experience at the hands of states and other actors across the world, perhaps something um, that has been brought home quite clearly, uh, in particular um, in the last week. Now, notoriously, this includes detention and deportation, policing, imprisonment, interceptions at sea, and other forms of state violence that impact in particular um, people who are racialized as black, brown, and indigenous, and in particular those from um, the majority world or the global south. And our past speakers in this series have grappled with a wide range of questions arising from these global immobilities, including race and racism, coloniality, nationalism, citizenship, belonging, criminalization, bordering. Um, and today, once again, we focus on global capitalism. And I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Ali Bagat as our, as our speaker for today. We'll speak on governing the displaced in global capitalism, refugee survival from the camp to the city. Dr. Bagat is an assistant professor at St. Mary's University in International Development Studies and Political Studies in Halifax, Canada. And until recently, he was a lecturer at the University of Manchester in International Relations and International Politics. And he's currently revising his monograph, Governing the Displaced, Race and Fantasy in Global Capitalism uh, with Cornell University Press. But before we start, once again, in personal capacity, I want to express my unreserved solidarity with all colleagues and comrades in the UK who are striking today and who are on the picket lines. As members of the university and college union UCU are fighting for a fair pension, for fair pay, for man manageable workloads against casualization and against racial, gender and disability pay gaps in UK academia. And if you want to know more about the dispute, um, you can go to ucu.org.uk. And please also consider giving money to the strike funds that will um, help our comrades uh, win this fight. Now, before I hand over to, to Ali, um, I just want to encourage everyone, um, as um, uh, Ali will talk to us, um, please submit your questions in the Q&A box um, that you'll find down there in the Zoom menu. Um, and after the talk, I will direct your questions to our speaker. Okay, over to you, Ali. All righty, let me just share my screen. How's that, Hannah? Yeah, that's fine. Oops. All right. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning from wherever you are. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, you know, it is with immense pleasure that I share my talk, uh, Governing the Displaced in Global Capitalism. Um, and I want to start with the fact that, and this might, this is a well known fact, but according to the UNHCR, about 84 million people were displaced worldwide by mid 20. Um, and we know that the causes of forced displacement range from intersection of uh, conflict, climate change, various economic reasons. And although uh, scholarly and policy attention examine these issues that refugee face at various stages of displacement, refugee survival must also be considered within global capitalism, which is the central aim of this talk. So I'd like to draw your attention to this image, which I feel crystallizes my research puzzle. Um, and it calls into question common sense perceptions of refugees uh, in isolated and in, in distant camps. And, and these perceptions are, as we know, inaccurate. You know, and they contrast UNHCR estimates where 60% of the world's refugee population lives in uh, urban settlements. And while the refugee crisis is often framed as an issue of borders and national security, refugee governance, which I say is comprised by the state, various levels of the state, international organizations, various NGOs and IOs and other private actors mask the urban realities of inequality, which characterize, which are characterized by widespread housing and work-related insecurity in both the global north and global south. 
So I'll detail refugee survival from the camp to the city. Um, and this is hinged on interventions that emerge in an era of an ongoing era of market oriented governments. So with this prompt in mind, um, I asked the following question that motivates this talk, uh, and it's a sweeping one, uh, and it's how are refugees governed in capitalism? And more or less, this talk is a, a tour of my book, you know, abbreviated one at least. Um, and in asking this question, I name the refugee crisis as a, as a trope, which allows us to more deeply understand the racialization of refugees as securitized subjects and therefore further dispel common sense notions of migrants as a threat to national security. So it's an equally significant in answering this question is I show the city as a site of refugee survival where the dynamics of global capitalism are rendered most visible. So to put my argument out there front and center, um, I argue that refugees are rendered disposable uh, populations in their attempt to survive in both camps and cities and by disposability, which I'll unpack in more detail later, I mean that refugees are framed by various government actors, media, et cetera, as though they are largely inconsequential to the needs of capital. They are distinguished from other marginalized groups, however, because they need humanitarian assistance. And this positioning um, brings me to understand refugee governance as hinged on, two, on dual policy directions uh, which to me encapsulate disposability, which is prevention and survival. So on one hand, refugees are actively excluded from formal political and economic spaces through border control and various categories that delineate those who are authentic and those who are not, uh, often on racial grounds, as we're going to continue to see even in this, uh, in this current moment as of this week. And on the other hand, even when refugees are accepted, the policies that encourage self-reliance continue to prevent their access to the two prongs of survival that emerge in the city, uh, shelter. So this, this talk aims to trace a through line by way of disposability uh, from camps to an explicit focus on two cities, uh, Paris and Nairobi. So I'll, I'll start by situating um, my work in uh, international political economy, which is uh, where my work is grounded, although I draw from uh, geography and other disciplines as well. And I do this to kind of frame my viewpoint. Uh, the second thing I'll do is talk about my theory and methods, and then I'll preface both the Paris and Nairobi cases with some regional and national attention um, that contextualizes these two states. Briefly, I take seriously Barakawi and Lafi's uh, concern for uh, critical IR uh, to take to, to understand the, the thick set of social relations by, by which uh, I think what matters is you know, everyday life. Um, and I also take inspiration from Shalia Mantilli on race markets, uh, as well as uh, Neil Brenner and Vita Danawood's work, uh, bridging the urban to the international. I'm really interested uh, in scholars like uh, Graminder Bamra's work on the colonial political economy uh, and Largely, I situate this work under emerging debates of race and capitalism. So I'll turn to a brief overview of my theoretical contentions in this talk and shed light on my methodological approach uh, that contextualizes this entire project. I arrived at disposability uh, through engagement with various conceptions of theorizing the urban precariat. For instance, uh, uh, Bauman and Agumbin's work, uh, Bare Life, Waste Populations, and more Marxist-oriented uh, concepts of the relative surplus population, uh, and even more recently, Gargi Patacharya's work on uh, edge populations, which uh, draws on Kalyan Sanyal's conception of the rising. Now, these uh, focus on the material dimensions of redundancy in capitalism, and I add that the governance of refugees renders refugees disposable both on material and ideological grounds. And so I define disposability through these dual directives of prevention and self-reliance, which to me operate at once, dialectically. Uh, disposability explains how refugee, refugee governance finds its internal logic, one where refugees are promised assistance and a future, and the other where uh, the refugee subject, so to speak, appears as a challenging force that requires heightened border security and therefore exclusion. But these are some of my methodological considerations. 
Paris and Nairobi were chosen as purposefully disparate sites as a way to connect the urban dimensions of disposability to global refugee governance. There are hotspots in their own right. Paris, of course, is underpinned by uh, a sweeping urban austerity and over 3.5 million people uh, currently live without adequate housing in France. Uh, France's uh, acceptance of asylum payments has been uh, hovering around 13%. Uh, and these ongoing prevention strategies continue to banish racialized refugees in, in the city as well. Uh, similarly, Nairobi has uh, received around between 70,000 to 100,000 urban refugees in the context of ongoing dismantling of the camps. Uh, most recently, there's a pledge to uh, dismantle all camps by uh, June of this year, which would mean a switch and a turn in Kenya's refugee management policy to some sort of integration, but also uh, large scale deportation. And in this context, urban refugees, at least in the time of writing, are de facto illegal subjects, and therefore their struggle to find shelter and meaningful income upon relocation is exacerbated at the level of the city. Uh, the methodology is in, in influenced by interpretivist commitments in IR and deconstructing these power relations. Um, and this approach helps us understand the undergirding material and disciplinary power of refugee governance. And that's why, for me, the refugee crisis in this rereading is considered as a trope, uh, which I unmask as a symptom of inequality and racial violence. And uh, of course, this is a qualitative study based on field research between 2017 and 2018. So moving on to contextualize uh, the empirical material, um, I wanna set up uh, the EU's role and how it affects uh, Paris, at least briefly. I mean, the image on the right here uh, explains these tensions between the dual aspects of disposability. EU actors appear as both accepting of refugees while also being complicit uh, in the violence that they face. And this becomes clearer uh, in the specific cases I'll show. But before that, I just wanted to provide a slight overview of uh, the common European asylum system, uh, which is developed by many EU actors, but uh, the Dublin protocol, the Dublin 3, Eurodac and Frontex are to me key examples of prevention led uh, strategies in the EU. And of course the Dublin uh, focuses on the prevention of asylum shopping, and trying to allocate uh, responsibility for various member states. The Eurodac is uh, a fingerprinting and biometric you know, agency, I want to call it. Uh, and Frontex, of course, is responsible for, uh, well, they are a Coast Guard agency and they want to intervene with uh, vessels trying to enter the EU. And these together, without going into too much detail, work to contextualize the EU migration system. Importantly for me, uh, these prevention strategies go beyond the EU borders. Uh, we see uh, a, and a look at these EU policies prevention outside Europe for, in Turkey and in Libya, for example, illustrates uh, the difficulty that refugees undergo uh, and the filtration process from country of origin to a country like France. Um, and these camps and detention sites are useful for us to understand the difficulties in even arriving at an urban center like Paris. Uh, there are also clear examples of abject exclusion and the material and ideological utility of refugees. And it's important to keep in mind though that refugees, they are rendered disposable here, their survival uh, doesn't matter to that EU wide strategy that it's largely based on exclusion. Uh, and these inform France's stance towards refugees as well. Um, there's a, another kind of ideological utility here or, or, or the utility of uh, people like Erdogan to flood, quote unquote, Europe with millions of refugees threatening uh, or reifying this idea of uh, state security and insecurity vis-a-vis -vis migrants. So this plays into the racialization, the further racialization of refugees from both Sub-Saharan Africa and, and the Middle East. So the context of this common European asylum system uh, and the widespread prevention strategies at Europe's frontiers, this doesn't disappear on the urban scale. And uh, refugee acceptance, indeed on the urban scale, is demarcated by race, uh, perceived cultural and economic instability, and, and the emphasis on the country of origin. 
itself. Um, even Germany, the most accepting state, rejected half of their asylum payments, while France is rejected well above 70%, pointing to this racial exclusion and prevention at the national scale. In any case, I contextualize the experience of refugee survival in Paris through this uh, dual lens of disposability, uh, and again, want to flag this uh, tension of prevention and self-reliance as it plays out on the American setting as well. Uh, just more briefly, I mean, most refugees are excluded from France, so they're sent back to ports of entry where they're likely to be processed out of the EU as well. So those who do not enter Paris face this ongoing uh, relentless displacement that occurs not only at the level of the city, but uh, is compounded by shelter and labor insecurity uh, and the overarching uh, infrastructure of, of, of prevention that uh, takes place in the EU. Uh, refugee survival in Paris is also characterized by this cyclical displacement, uh, not only due to the Dublin system, but also because of the because of ongoing housing insecurity in Paris itself. Uh, for instance, and, and and while rates of acceptance of refugees vary, uh, there is a, a racialized component of who gets accepted and not. So uh, Syrian and Afghani refugees see higher rates of acceptance, above 80%, whereas refugees from Sub-Saharan Africa are more often considered illegal migrants or economic migrants, uh, regardless, and, and regardless of their status, uh, most refugees still contend with shelter and income-related insecurity, and many end up still uh, dovetailing with extant homeless populations in, in Paris. Um, Interestingly, in the initial days of my uh, of, of heightened migration, uh, my research participants revealed to me that Paris was this relatively open city, uh, as people were politically motivated uh, by the violence of the Syrian refugee crisis and the body of LA and Kurdi washing up on Europe shores. Um, but then, and at that time, there were makeshift camps that popped up under the subway stations of Juarez and Stalingrad. And even basic health services were there. NGOs were handing out blankets and the, and the city was providing free Wi-Fi. But under the context of Islamophobia in France uh, and you know, the candidacy of Marine Le Pen, these camps were violently shut down. And this picture uh, from January last year, the camps and or tented makeshift shelters, they keep returning, but it also points us to the state-led violence that refugees face as they live on the street. Uh, and the you know, compounding issues of homelessness and lack of viable shelter opportunities. As I mentioned, France is a big user of the Dublin regulation and sends many refugees uh, back to their ports of entry as, uh, as many of my, uh, oops, seems... jumped a couple of slides there. So refugee housing access in Paris can't be really separated from austerity and uh, the high rental rates and low social housing stock that already contextualize the city. Uh, so Paris's rental rates hover around a thousand euros for a one bedroom and an average wait time for social housing, uh, according to the officials, is around three years. But this uh, for, for you know, multifamily households or various other circumstances, some people, in fact, wait many, many years to get housing in, in Paris. Uh, as you'll see in this picture here, Paris's solution to the, the rampant kind of migrant homelessness was the creation of this first urban refugee camp known as, known as the bubble. And there's two contradictory stories about this. The first one was, you know, celebrating Paris as uh, an innovator, an innovative solution to housing migrants. Uh, but in visiting these, in visiting this bubble, uh, it was very apparent that many refugees were still sleeping um, around the bubble, hoping to be processed or hoping to be given a bed. Uh, meanwhile, this was acting more like a processing center, uh, giving people beds for a, a few days, sometimes even a couple of weeks, but then moving them to other parts of France, another example of uh, ongoing displacement as well. In, in general, the Paris case to me reveals a, a sink or swim approach 
to accessing shelter uh, with cyclical homelessness being a big part of the story. Uh, some people opt for a, a, a monthly payment called the ADA, which is the allocation for asylum seekers, which accounts to, amounts to about seven euros a day. And interestingly, this also facilitates further displacement because of rent being so unaffordable. So many, uh, many people that I interviewed that were receiving this ADA lived in overcrowded housing and were often exploited for this, uh, for this amount because uh, the landlord or even sometimes uh, their uh, kinship networks knew that this money was coming in. So at the end, they were left with very little for their basic needs. And it, it's pointing again to this, uh, this idea of self-reliance, the, the limits of uh, a city and a state that at least in our minds registers as a, a welfare state and yet uh, migrants in many ways slip through these cracks. Uh, in terms of work, urban refugees are also rendered disposable in terms of uh, trying to find some sort of meaningful or long-term uh, occupation. Uh, and it's important to note that shelter and work are interrelated. Uh, the image on the right illustrates this fantasy of an ideal refugee subject, one that's appropriately integrated and self-reliant. Um, and of course, this is the key policy directive of refugee management. The logic of self-reliance in terms of work rests on these tools of language training, uh, integration through community engagement, and an improvement in civil service. And none of these things are uh, wrong or bad, but the tools miss a more robust directive of long-term shelter, which is key to building a sense of community, for example. It's imaginably difficult for, de facto, homeless people to become entrepreneurs or find formal employment. And yes, language skills speed up integration, but taking classes in the face of insecure housing and living through various homeless shelters, this is an extremely difficult task. So refugees rely on a piecemeal network of state assistance, NGOs and private assistance. Uh, for example, the Calm NGO was considered the Airbnb of refugees where uh, uh, a refugee family would live with a French family and they learned the, job, uh, the language and then they were better prepared for the job market. And again, this is a this is it's not a bad thing at all but the downloading of that responsibility is now faced uh, is now placed on uh individuals or families and goodwill so the, it, it it masks again this larger crisis of inequality and not only are these solutions unsustainable but they also take away attention from the fact that the system is predicated on disposability and that disposability masks everyday realities of poverty so Again, it's, I want to reiterate my argument here that refugees from the camp to the city are disposable either through this abject or cyclical exclusion or this lack of assistance upon relocation. This Paris case illustrates how prevention and self-reliance uh, directions are at play simultaneously. Uh, while the Dublin system shows how France bounces many refugees out of the country, the refugees who do remain in the city cycle in and out of street living uh, poor shelter conditions, and then they're exploited for their small allowance money, uh, and then, you know, it's very difficult to access formal long-term work, um, and this integration rests on their own self-reliance, uh, and this is a policy approach that appears in Nairobi too, and has gained ideological traction uh, in development as a market-driven solution to assistance. A topic I didn't delve into, but you know, happy to discuss it, uh, is also the type of precarious work that some queer refugees in particular have to do. And many of them turn to sex work uh, for income or for shelter for uh, one or two nights. And so again, it shows us how refugees are uh, this population of greater marginality uh, than the extant poor in Paris. I'll now move on to examine disposability uh, through uh, the case in, in, in Kenya and I want to flag that while these geopolitical contexts and histories are undoubtedly variant, uh, the cross-cutting logics of disposability, they remain similar. So the two camps here, for me, iterate prevention and self-reliance, and they are again demarcated by perceptions of race. And Dadab and Kakuma have been uh, well covered in the literature. Uh, and as I was saying, there's a constant threat of 
of dismantling again in 2022, this has appeared again. So the situation is of course in, in, in flux and I, I don't mean to capture the entirety of, of, of camp life in, in Kenya. But for me, what stuck, sticks out is that the dog becomes a, a chronic long-term uh, hosting ground for mostly Somali refugees. And the dub is therefore categorized by debt, not only because of a lack of funding and, and donor fatigue and all sorts of issues that uh, in, in running this large scale, basically a city uh, takes, but also because refugees can have to rely on credit systems to get by. And then there's the violence associated with the middlemen that they, that they end up uh, dealing with. There's also all sorts of so-called voluntary repatriation under uh, the premise of some sort of monetary incentive. And so the Dadaab case is of course very complicated and it shows us how um, Somalis in particular are targeted uh, for removal. And this, this uh, takes place on, in, in Nairobi as well, where we're seeing a racialization of the, of the Somali migrant slash refugee as a, uh, as a terrorist. In contrast, Kakuma, uh, through the Kalabai Integrated Settlement, is basically open for business. So the idea is that uh, fintech companies and even Mastercard and Western Union could see this place as a, a as a market space and uh, as a solution uh, to transform refugees from camp inhabitants to uh, entrepreneurs. And there's and the tensions therein, of course. Uh, because of Turkana County being amongst the poorest, there might be some benefit to uh, Turkana County people as well. Uh, if the you know the integrated settlement ends up uh, being successful, but it but recent research has pointed out that it's in fact not that it's uneven in uh, in uh, in its ability to uh, alleviate poverty. But again, I, I raise these two camps as. Uh, examples of prevention and self-reliance that also come through to the to the city scale in Nairobi as well. And the Nairobi case parallels Paris in its commitments to prevention and self-reliance. And yes, disposability has these various manifestations in these two cities, but I want to pay attention to some of these cross-cutting logics. So uh, it's important to note that because Kenya practices a policy of encampment as of now, uh, urban refugees, depending again on the considerations around uh, ethnicity and race, some are considered more legal and than others, but the position is that the camps are uh, the place where people need to, for refugee, refugees need to go for that type of assistance. So in general, many of the refugees I interviewed face arbitrary harassment, but again, this is uneven and, and it occurs uh, around the lines of, uh, you know, who belongs and who doesn't in the city. On the urban scale, this has led to uh, the deportation and rounding up of, of many refugees. And this occurs again, it's not all the time, but it occurs at key moments. Uh, particular one example that many uh, of my interlocutors talked about was the rounding up of Somalis uh, in the Kasrani Stadium after the uh, Westgate shopping mall attacks. This idea that the state needs to do uh, to show that it's a strong state, that it's uh, targeting uh, various, uh, it's targeting the imminent threat, the, the Somali threat in the city. Uh, and in general, urban refugees in Nairobi, they're not allowed to receive formal work permits. So they face undue targeting from the state, pointing to further pointing to that level of disposability. So these deportations and roundups further illustrate the linkage to the Paris case where uh, refugees are continually harassed uh, by the police and they're forced to leave their home even when they do make it to the city which exists more so as a fantasy or a fantasy haven than, uh, than its actual social reality. So it goes without saying then that 91% of Nairobi's population rents and thus a lot of racial exclusion is evidenced in accessing racial uh, rental housing. So refugees are charged a premium by landlords due to their legal status in some instances, and housing access proves difficult uh, with many instances of eviction. So 
formal work very difficult to find. So many refugees rely on insecure and unstable paychecks, and thus they systemically face more uh, face evictions. For example, a South Sudanese refugee I interviewed said that she lived in one area for around 15 years, and she was aided by her fellow countrymen. And her most challenging issue, she said, is I sell handicrafts and have a very small business, but I cannot afford to feed uh, my children and pay rent at the same time. Another issue arises in accessing safe and secure housing, free from social violence. So someone uh, basically said that, another interlocutor said that they uh, couldn't access, that because of their perceived queerness and foreignness, they were also evicted uh, in the area that they were living. So in a survey conducted by 241 refugees uh, from uh, the I IED, the most significant issue in terms of adequate shelter access was housing affordability, followed by access to water and electricity. And so refugees also found their neighborhoods unsafe uh, due to uh, shelter insecurity and crime. Uh, for example, a Congolese refugee interviewed in the Karagocho informal settlement told me that despite making his rental payments, the leaders of the community forced him out of his home and he had and he just stepped out to, to run an errand uh, and he came back to his belongings being thrown on the street. So uh, the leaders basically said, you're foreign, we don't want you here. We want this person to live here instead. Uh, so the key policy directive of self-reliance rears its head once more. And it's important to keep in mind that Kenya was one of the first countries in the world to undergo structural adjustment and that eviscerated any semblance of a welfare state. There, is some, there are some government-led initiatives for affordable housing and slum upgrading, but with refugees as basically illegal subjects, they aren't beneficiaries and sometimes are even evicted as a result of these processes as slum upgrading often results in higher uh, rental costs because of whatever the feature that was upgraded. So with a lack of formal work permits, refugees then rely on NGO facilitated microfinance loans and job training. And these necessarily aren't a, a bad thing. I, I, there, there is some uneven evidence for the success and, and the necess necessity of access to credit. However, this is buttressed as the sole solution because the, the national government refuses work permits but allows business licenses for a fee. So there's no real choice. Many refugees attempt thus to transform themselves into entrepreneurs, again, amidst these development discourses of bootstrapping and self-driven poverty alleviation. So in my observation with uh, Refugees Affairs Secretariat official, I listened in on these advice sessions where the RAS officials um, denied work permits and suggested you know, return to camps. And it shows this key contribution, right? Uh, contradiction, rather. Officials say return to camps, but as we know, these camps are always under the threat of being shut down, and life in these camps can be brutally violent. So, and we know that the camps aren't well serviced either. So, one reading of that could be that they're holding grounds for an eventual uh, wide scale deportation. Many NGOs that offer microfinance loans and sometimes interest free loans, or what they call merry go round loans, want to make sure that the money that they that the money that they have, the little pots money they have access to, they don't go to waste. And undoubtedly, many of many of these many of the refugees in the city are a flight risk because they have such initial capital to begin with. So entrepreneurialism emerges not as the material benefit to most to the most precarious people, but it's bolstered by these ideological foundations of poverty alleviation away from state intervention. So these strategies, they're often piecemeal and effective and many refugees like other, as the literature covers, as other poor indebted people in the global south, use these small cash injections to buy essential goods and pay for rent, despite the suggestion of model uh, refugees in pictures like this that have set up their handicraft um, businesses um, as, as, a, as, a, as a model, I guess, of uh, self-reliance and uh, self-driven poverty alleviation. So just to sum up the Nairobi case, refugees emerge as a, a disposable population in even more extreme ways than the so-called populations that are surplus to capital, which is visible on the everyday scale. Nairobi has a large uh, 
surplus population of workers um, and informal laborers, and thus refugees are seen as both unwanted in the city and undeserving of aid. If they do survive, they must do so through these classic market-driven self-reliance models. And there's that logic of capital accumulation here at play again, that if they do wanna be successful, they must integrate themselves into the market. And then again, we see this disciplinary logic of entrepreneurialism. To conclude, um, we see parallels here. There's this idea of doing business in Kakuma, uh, refugee entrepreneurship in the food market, and then uh, this uh, mission in France to uh, promote a new, a new vision and approach of refugees' role, uh, uh, contribute to French society through entrepreneurship. And while Paris and Nairobi and all of the regional contexts that they're associated with, they're vastly different spaces. I've been really interested in the similarities that allow us to understand this idea of disposability in global capitalism. So in both cases, racial exclusion based on refugee status and country of origin demarcates who belongs in the city in terms of access to services and who doesn't. And the urban refugee experience is characterized by shelter and work-related insecurity where disposability shows an unfulfilled fantasy of relocation. And again, these two, the, these two policy directives or directions, um, one of pre prevention and the other of self-reliance cut across these two uh, cases. Why does this all matter? I think uh, it matters because the crisis to me is a trope and, it's just, and it points out the way that the system is supposed to work. It masks extant shelter and income related issues where Many people in both the global north and global south, they're rendered surplus to the needs of capital. And importantly, while the system prides itself on being humanitarian, it, it's fundamentally grounded by facilitating racialized exclusion. So disposability brought to you know, IPE and IR largely shows us the, the material and ideological functions of governance that, cut, that cuts across the various scales in the global political economy. And so self-reliance and, and prevention are predicated by ideological commitments and perceptions of individualism, liberty, and market-driven development. So by framing my analysis around disposability as a concept and the urban as the important focus of survival governance, we can collapse and blur these boundaries of the global north and south and hopefully contribute to uh, an emerging research agenda in IRIP. So thank you so much for listening and uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for, for your time. Thank you for, for speaking to us tonight. Um, and I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation another time. And thanks to the audience. Uh, thanks very much. And next week, uh, we've got our last talk, uh, Dr. Maurice Steele. Um, same time, same venue online. Please register if you haven't yet. Um, and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.